place, but no cigar for the first time since I began doing the fireside chats. Because, as I explained to you last week, the folks at, uh, where is it? At, uh, Facebook. at Facebook, yes, said we could not promote a video that had any cigar smoking in it. So, as I said last week, maybe I should have told them it was marijuana, yeah. and then, then it wouldn't have been an issue. Uh, I, I spoke last week as to my philosophy of life and about enjoying life without taking ridiculous risks. So I'm not going to repeat any of that, but that is the reason for no cigar. The reason uh, uh, I know I'm going to cause people to notice what they probably haven't, but some have. I uh, I had an, I my foot st stepped into a little hole coming out of a restaurant two nights ago, and I fell face forward. So I have a beautiful black eye. The rest is invisible thanks to a great makeup artist. I'm fine, but I just wanted to explain that. My guest did not punch me. Uh, I wish I had a great story about uh, somebody uh, in the the opposite political realm came over and punched me and nothing nothing dramatic like that. Anyway, uh, welcome. It is great to be with you. As I always explain, this is truly uh, an opportunity to have completely unscripted talk about everything and anything that you ask. But today is very special. Uh, because very, very rarely do I have a guest on the a fireside chat I have on my radio show regularly, but here it's really just you and I. But in this case, this guy is very special. And uh, he's Stephen Crowder, who needs no introduction to about 87.4% of you. Would you say that that is accurate? You know, I, I have no idea how many ne'er-do-wells watch this show, but if there's a significant percentage, then that sounds about right. <laughs> I would imagine your audience is more productive, uh, but no, I appreciate you. I appreciate the the very kind introduction. And no, and I house. will give you a kind introduction. You're a terrific person. You have great values. You're very funny. You're very eloquent. No, that's the real good introduction. Uh, and you have your own show, Louder with Crowder, which I have been on quite a number of times. And a lot of people, uh, you have, it's, it's tremendously uh, seen, isn't it? Tell everybody about Ladder with Crowder and yourself. Now that I've introduced you, you introduce well, me. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that, that was uh, overly kind. Now I feel like I've got, a, I've got a tough act to follow just in the things that you've said about me. But, um, you know, it's Ladder with, it's Ladder with Crowder com. People can go check it out or just on YouTube as long as the overlords still allow us there. Um, it's basically a late night show and, I, you know, I happen to be conservative. Uh, it, it's not a it's not a podcast. It's a forty four minute late night program. And you know, we set out to to do the show that I always wished existed. I, when I grew up, I was really early Letterman was my thing. My parents used to tape it on VHS, and uh, then they would you know fast forward the parts that I shouldn't watch. But uh, Rupert's Deli, Larry Bud Nelman, that was what I grew up on. And now everything is so far left with late night. That's that's really what the show is. And uh, if you're looking for something to go to go to sleep with and, and get the news of the day and, and not want to you know. Hang yourself. So how do people is. find it? Tell them exactly what to do. Just either Google, uh, search my name. Well, I can't say Google anything. Lotterwithcrowder.com, and that'll link to the YouTube, or if you join up, uh, there's a mug club there, my YouTube channel. It's all linked at lotterwithcrowder.com. That's the central hub that hopefully they can't take away. So how do, how do you get successful? I mean, thank God I was successful at, at a very young age, but it, it was it was, it took such... Uh, a bizarre constellation of things to happen. Yeah. How does a normal, talented person like you get successful so young? It is a pride-swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about. Um, no, it's a... Uh, you know, I, I started acting when I was 12, doing voice work, and... That's okay, this is Otto. They're trying to keep the bulldog out. Otto, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otto, Otto come Otto, on in here. Everyone, Otto, you're going to be the biggest... Now he doesn't want to come Otto isn't sure what he wants. He wants to be um, with my wife. <laughs> okay, I mean, when all is said and done... It's adorable bulldog. No, 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 it's not going to work. You can, bulldogs are very stubborn. Yeah, they're very right. stubborn. Anyway, um, if he walks in, it's fine. So I, I was acting uh, very young, you know, being... Wait, you, wait, wait, wait. So you began as an actor? Yeah, a voice Voice actor, kid? yeah, oh. voice actor, and then commercials, television, film, and then uh, where in Montreal? Okay, yeah, Montreal. My first gig was a kids show called Arthur. You know, Arthur the Aardvark, where uh, it was so a talking Aardvark. No, Ardvark. yeah, Arthur the Aardvark. Yes, I was the brain, was a smart no, no, friend. I didn't see, you didn't I, see? I, I have no just, idea. I don't, know. Well, I don't know. You have kids. I thought There's, maybe you had a CD wait, no, 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 on no. Do you guys have seen it? No, no, that was popular. That is a big deal. It I'm was, not kidding. It, you know what's true about Arthur? Yes. It was actually the most watched family show in the '90s. When they did a top ten shows. Is was, that right? It was number six. Everything else was, you know, friends. So Seinfeld. wait, you were the voice for Arthur the Yardvar? No, I actually I went into audition to do Arthur, 
and uh, because the guy grew out of it. And they were looking for a new Arthur, and they immediately said, no, you're not right, and sent me home packing. And so this was just, you know, it was another audition that I just, just absolutely just, just miffed. And uh, I uh, then called them was back. Was this they in said, English or French? English. And oh, then, you speak French. Yes, I do speak French. Right. That's why they thought I was special needs until the fourth grade, because I was in French school. I speak French, but I can't learn math in French, uh, at least not well. And uh, then uh, they said, you know what, come back if you can do an impression of the kid who grew out of the role for the brain, which was a smart friend who was a bear. So Aardvark, a bear, has a pet dog. I mean, someone was dropping acid when they wrote this show. But uh, I went in, and I could do a really good impression of the brain, so I was the second brain. And uh, then they fired me when I was 13. They said, your voice changed. And I said, no, I can do it. And they said, get out of here. So fired yeah. at 13. Okay. And uh, then the unions slowed everything down in Canada, the, the actors' unions. And so I started doing stand-up uh, in my my teen years. And that just took me around, you know, uh, shooting pilots and doing every crappy club you could imagine. And then I was... So you always wanted to do something in, in acting. That's the only thing I ever wanted to do was, was, was funny. That, uh, that's yeah. so interesting. Because I failed at everything else. You know, when you're a kid in no, school no, and no, you're no, not no. very good and right. they think you're learning no, no, it, but no, you no. can make the... Kids laugh. You're, you're being you're being self-critical, which is fine. It's, it's actually it beats self-esteem. But the uh, the point is, from my perspective, it's eerie that we're just born with certain dispositions. I mean, you were born to be a comedian, in effect. Yeah, I think I was born to do what I'm doing right now, honestly. Which is both, because I know you from the serious side. Yeah. With the values that we share, which obviously we'll get into in a moment, sure. but. But that was, the, if someone would have said to you at 14, what do you want to be when you grow up? You would have said? I would have, well, it's funny. At one point I would have said uh, Academy Award winning actor until I realized it was corrupt. And I said, you know what? I'll settle for late night host. So, you know, I was, it's yeah, kind of like my safety's harbored, you know, at that point. And uh, then, not, you know, remember this conservatives just constantly complained about where is a conservative late night? Where is a conservative daily show? And I, I will say I was amongst them. I was at Fox News for four and a half years and pitching day in and day out the show that we do now. And they, I was always, always told this will never work. Conservatives don't do funny. This isn't what they like. Why did people, why would people say that? I, you know, I was turning The my, irony is I don't find a left wing humor funny, it's mean. Yeah, I don't find mean funny. Sometimes I find funny funny, witty funny. But mean is kind of subjective, though, right? No, I mean, I, mean is the, the the point of it is to hurt the target, not to lampoon, not to make uh, you know nice fun of, but to to lampoon. Uh, and I, I don't, I never like that. I I I'm totally anti humiliating people. Well, I've done that quite well. We did, you know, I did do a parody of Bob Ross. Painting, we remember Bob Ross and PBS. Yeah, but, the, but but I painted Muhammad. Okay, fine. That, that's not the same thing. You don't need. I don't well, even the, know the, if you the know how to be mean. People who got mad about it thought it okay, was. Okay, that's fine. But I'm not sure you know how to be mean, and that's why you're asking what does mean mean. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> because, I mean, subject because YouTube often thinks that I'm mean, right? They think that that's mean. The Muhammad thing. They said it wasn't in accordance no, with that's Islamic law. No, no. Well, that's not mean. That's taking a position on on freedom. Yeah. That, that's a, on free expression. That's not an issue of mean. Well, uh, if, if you were to if you were to take a Muslim person from the audience and start making fun of them, that's mean. Right. But to take a position on hello, I am in the West. I am allowed to draw Jesus or Muhammad or Moses or Buddha uh, or or Trump, uh, and and that's not mean. Right. No, I, I think I think it's I wouldn't you know I would go a little bit further and say not necessarily mean but mean spirited. And I think there's a difference because some comedy can be mean to different people because they don't like the target. But there's a difference between that and a mean spiritedness that you see in certain comedy. And I think that's probably what what bothers people like you and myself. Okay. Bullying. Yes, bullying, humiliating. I, that's the one. That's why I don't like what's his name. The um, uh, who, who's the guy? We we saw the movie with him where he where he leads people on to believe who he is. You know. Oh, Borat. Yeah. I, I, he he humiliates people. Not everybody. Yeah. And some some are genuinely funny. He obviously is very witty. Yeah. Uh, but but leading people on by acting as something else, I don't find that funny because you're taking a person's trust and mocking them for it. Yeah. So okay, that's just an example of to me sure. over the top. But anyway, so that's what you wanted to be, and yeah. so you got into it very fast. I mean, you clearly. No, no, it was a long time. I mean, long you know, time. The guy's thirty-one. Well, give me, I mean, I've been doing give it since. Give me a break. <laughs> but I mean, I've been doing this since since about you know seventeen professionally. You know, I. Yes. Yeah, so what do you mean it took a long time? 
Well, I guess, okay. Since what? Since you, from between 3 and 17? Well, you said you were successful young. What, what yes, you I was. Oh, I what was. Age? I was lecturing at 21. I wrote my first book at 25. Okay. Well, so that's what I mean. I feel, obviously, I, I just, you know, got done talking with Ben Shapiro and yourself. You know, he was playing Carnegie Hall at what, when he okay. was like two and a half? All right, well, he beat so me at 31, that. Yes. you know, I right. feel like I'm an underachiever. Okay, <laughs> okay fine. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> Be that as it may, you were successful young. I you're, but it. you're doing what you want now. Yes. Uh, tell everybody what it is you're doing, although many know. Yeah, so it's, well, it's, it's just the late night show. It's the show that I always wanted to do uh, when I was at Fox News, when I was uh, doing stand-up. You know, when I say I feel like I was designed to do what I'm doing now, I was a, I will say this, I was a good stand-up comedian, but I would watch people like Nick DiPaolo and get sad because I'd go, I, I can never be as good uh, of a comedian as Nick. He's just born to be the best stand-up there is. Um, but I could do pretty good impressions, or I could I could do some characters that maybe guys like him couldn't, but I couldn't really incorporate it on stage. With what we do now, you know, we do jokes and monologues, and then we also do the, the sort of dive-in segments that maybe aren't as funny, but more informative, along with sketches and impressions. It's just... Well, when you have set. me on, it's it's pretty serious stuff. Yeah, it's 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 so kind you of do, blend. you do both. Yeah, we do both. Right. I, I really I'm, I feel very blessed to be free to do the kind of show that I wished existed when I was uh, in my twenties and what I love to do. Now, do do you have folks you don't agree with on? Oh, all the time. Yeah, and, and is that is that a this is not meant as a joke? Is it a comedy part or a serious part? No, no, it's a serious part. Right. The biggest thing we've ever done is something called change my mind, and that's where I just go onto a campus and it, I will have a banner that says there are only two genders. Change my mind, and unedited interviews where anyone can sit down. Oh, and that's terrific. Argue. That's great. And we just did one at the White House in front of the White House. Donald Trump is not a fascist. Change my mind, and we had one conversation that was very productive where the kid ended up changing his mind, and we had one lady who sat down and just berated me and yelled at me. So. Yeah, we, we, we get to do a lot of different things. Well, so the fortunate. lady who sits down and just yells at you is not a dialogue. No, but I think it's important for people to see unedited both. That there are some people who can sit down on the left who are not beyond hope, you know, who, who uh, are open-minded, whose minds can be changed. And there are some people who are just so dyed in the wool that you've actually got to make an example of them for the people who are listening whose minds can be changed. You grew up in Montreal. What took you to the United States? Well, I was born in Detroit which really could just be annexed and given to Canada if you wanted to. Right. Uh, my mom was French-Canadian. Windsor West. Yes, exactly. <laughs> With a little more crime. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, I always wanted to come back to the United States. Because you know why? Because people in Canada, I had teachers who hated the United States. I had a teacher. Oh, of course. Can I say her name? Can I? Mrs. Lake. Oh, I Mrs. Lake. Matter if I say. She's yes. notorious. Yes, Mrs. Yeah, Lake. Mrs. Lake. Well, looking back, she was clearly uh, a lesbian. Uh, and clearly a far leftist. She berated my dad for half an hour on the Vietnam War at the parent-teacher conferences. And my dad, and I, I, looking back, I understand why when I failed her class, my dad would usually get mad. He didn't say anything. Uh -huh. He knew that he I was set up why. to fail. Because I grew up in a, it's like training with a weighted vest. There was this anti-American streak in Canada that made me identify with it even more. Right. When I was your age, uh, I would, uh, well, I, I've never stopped traveling. Uh, and But... When I w would travel at your age, I would bump into Americans who would have the maple leaf Just on so the they back. wouldn't get guff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, in Europe, they're much friendlier to Canadians. That's right. And yes. I, 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 it annoys me a whole lot. I'm very ashamed of our prime minister right now. I think it's a, a national embarrassment. You went from the best world leader to one of the worst. Stephen Harper was our Ronald Reagan. Yes, I said that all the time. Yeah. He, he, exactly right. In fact, we're having him at the next PragerU conference. Oh, great. Yes, he'll be our guest. Yeah, he, he might actually be in, in studio on, on our program. By and... the way, you'll love this. Okay, yeah. go finish your statement. No, no, I want to yeah. hear, I, I hear what I'll love. You will love this. You will love this. The, I'm sorry to say this, the late Charles Krauthammer, who was from Montreal, right. or grew up in Montreal. And uh, I asked him on my show once, because I, I never asked him political questions, because if you wanted to hear him politically, it's so easy. He's doing it everywhere. So, but I asked him human questions. So I said, Charles, you grew up in Canada, so in a nutshell, what's the biggest difference between Canada and the United States? And it is it was typical of his speed that he came up with a brilliant answer it, it's without having to breathe. He said, oh, Dennis, I'll tell you the difference. The the uh, What is the American motto? Um, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from the Declaration of Independence. And what is the Canadian motto from its Declaration of Independence, although it's not called that, whatever its declaration is, 
peace, order, and good government. Right, yeah. I thought, that's brilliant. Yeah. The difference between life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and peace, order, and good government. Well, freedom of speech doesn't exist there. And people in the United States, when I tell them, for example, where I, I talked about uh, one of the change my minds was hate, hate speech is not real, change my mind. And we had some guys freaking out on me in, in Burlington, Vermont, of all places, you know, Bernie territory. Well, you know, there's a good example. Bernie was on that flight, if you want to hear that story afterwards about meanness. Um, but, uh, you know, in Canada, <coughs> I've had comedians on my show who were left when I was working the circuit in Canada who mocked Stephen Harper and now have been put before human rights tribunals because of jokes. And now that's what's turned them right wing. Um, I was always dumbfounded. I remember when there was the election, everyone got on stage at this place Comedy Works, an open mic night, and everyone was just, just complaining, just ripping into Stephen Harper. And I was going, do you, do you know he's the only guy who isn't trying to silence your ability to make a living? They never understood it. No. And a lot of them still don't get they it. They don't get it. They don't get it in Canada. Um, right. But oh, did you want the Bernie story? Yeah. Bernie was on that flight. We were going to Bur Burlington, Vermont. I swear to you, because I've, you know, I've done a ton of Bernie Sanders video. I do this impression of Bernie Sanders, and it's, it's basically Gilbert Godfrey as Bernie Sanders. Um, I would blow out the mics if I did it in your wonderful office, so I won't do it. But because I had kind of become synonymous with this Bernie impression, I see him on the flight, and here's what's so funny. He is one seat, Dennis, behind first class. Mm -hmm. So first class, he has the economy, comfort, plus, plus. He has everything but the complimentary cocktail. Right. And I could tell he had the brand new iPad because I could tell by, is it bezel or bevel, whatever they call it? Uh, and he's sitting there, and I tell my friends, I say, Bernie's in this flight. Like, you, you have to you have to go up and confront him to the point where I put on my anti-socialism T-shirt in the airplane bathroom. Uh, and uh, people out there know what the T-shirt is. And uh, I get off, and Bernie Sanders is walking off of the plane, and I'm getting ready to go up and confront him, and I couldn't do it because at this point, it wasn't Bernie Sanders. I just, he looked, he was he was walking like Brooks in Shawshank, kind of bow-legged, and it just looked like this really lonely, old, broken-down man. I just felt like I can't do it because it's 12, it's it's midnight, I'd catch him off guard. And everyone said, why why didn't you do it? I'm like, you know what, There hopefully be, there'll be another time. Anyway, the, the, no, but you were right not to do it. it, it it's... We don't like when they confront us in our private space. Right. And and we shouldn't do it to them. So I I, I, I back your decision. Yeah. You know, leave, leave them alone. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's... And this was right after the Ted Cruz debate. Remember where we just got... He got the, the... Ted Cruz mopped the floor with him? Yeah. It was right after that. And all I was going to do was walk up and say, hey, tough, tough break with uh, Senator Cruz and keep walking. Because those little things are what really hurt. Just those little things. You just assume that he knows he bombed. Look, I... I deeply dislike everything he stands for. Yeah. I, I, uh, he, I consider him a true fool. Uh, there are fools, and then there are true fools. Yeah. To grow up in the United States, to have lived through the Cold War, and to be a socialist is definitional to the word fool. It means that you love ideas more than you love people, which, by the way, is my view of the entire left. They are crazy about ideas, and they have contempt for human beings. Raising the minimum wage, even though more people will not get jobs, more restaurants will close, and more people will be fired, does not bother anybody on the left. Right. No consequences of their positions bother them. No. It's, they it's, want to feel good about themselves, and they love ideas. You know, that's a good point. I always say it's, it's cashing in on envy disguised as empathy. They're, they're not compassionate. And if you look no. at Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, who got screwed the middle class? Who got screwed with Obamacare? It wasn't the people who weren't in the health, it, 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 who didn't have health care until the exchange, who many of whom were not legal citizens anyway. It was the middle class who could no longer afford the skyrocketing premium so they could subsidize everyone else. It really is, I mean, I, I've talked about this in the show, from the way they propose taxes to the way they score children's soccer games. Uh, do, do you really think they're not keeping score in a kid's soccer match out of compassion? No, it's because the oh. kids who lose are envious, so they cash in on that, and you rob the people who've earned that victory. You rob them of it to give it to the envious, and, and it really bothers me. The not keeping score or giving kids trophies for not winning, <laughs> I am proud to tell you, we are obviously, I'm a generation ahead of you, so I have a grandchild. I want you to know one of my claims to fame. Are you ready? is that my seven-year-old grandson was on a team that lost and rejected the trophy.
Really? I give, I did not know it. My son told it to me. Great. He, he knew it would make not my day, but my year. And that, I'm so proud of him. Yeah. I learned about it from my son. When he was that age, they began it. And he, he like all Pragers, was on a team that almost never won. He was on the last place baseball team. And he got a trophy. And I said, David, why did you get a trophy? You lost. And he said, for playing. He was dead serious. Wow. For And and, I, and that's when I, I, I gave him a sweet talk. Playing does not earn a trophy any more than breathing earns a trophy. Well, you know what it is? It's it's a lie. And the truth it's is, a if, lie. If you've that's ever right. seen the truth, that that's trophy, right. which is a lie, it will poison your soul. Yes. It yes. will bother you for the rest of your life. That's right. You'll look at it and you'll know it's a lie. Yes, you should throw it away, actually. That's right. Well, I don't know. Maybe you can pawn so it. So let me ask you. So, so you were you always conservative? Yeah. Yeah, I will say I was. I, oh, well, obviously you were raised in a conservative home because your father got yelled at by Mrs. Lake. Yes. By the way, was it Ms. Lake or Mrs. Lake? I don't know, but she kicked me out of class for saying there were 50 states. For knowing it? No, she claimed there were 52. Or Canada being one of them? <laughs> No, 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 no. It was no. not a joke. She goes, maybe she, no, 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 no. she, maybe goes, she ah, believed in America. Remember Alaska and Hawaii. And I remember the words yeah, that got she, me kicked out. I went, because she said, this is exactly how the conversation went. She said, ah, 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 don't forget Hawaii and Alaska. And I responded, ah, 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 including them, there's 50 states. And she kicked me out. That's precious. So I prank called her 15 years so, later, and I just left a voicemail that said, 50 states. Click. Swear to you, that's a true story. And she died. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't laugh at that. That's you mean. Um, but uh, no, it was. It, I, I was. It, well, here's the one thing. It's like, kind of like when people say, "Were you always a Christian?" At some point, you choose, right? Everyone chooses. Right. Um, Life is all choices. And same thing with conservative. By the way, not making a choice is a choice. People yes. need to understand that all of life is a choice. Go on. That's a very good point. Not yep. making a choice is a choice. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, I, you know, when I started acting really young, my dad explained to me how taxes work. And, of course, we had socialized health care and a 52%, you know, marginal uh, tax rate there in, in, in Quebec. And so I, it was as simple when I started with, but hold on a second, that's my money. And then he said, okay, well, why do you think that, what do you think is the fair amount to pay? So I was raised in a Christian household, but the economics... Did you really go to church every Sunday? Uh, not every, most because Sundays. That's yeah. pretty rare, uh, in, in Canada. Yes. Yeah, it is. It's actually, Quebec is the most unchurched population. That's right. In the I know, I know. Yeah. That's right. One of the highest abortion rates too. Yeah. Well, um, well, they, they, they do go together in many, in many instances. Yep. But yeah, it's really, it's really sad. It really is. Um, when I went back and Do you visited, go to church now? I do. Yeah. Very nice. I do go to church on Sundays. And, um, I, uh, when I went back and visited Montreal, cause I, because I went with my wife, and so she's seeing these giant... Well, your wife is American. Yes, she's American. She Where'd you meet been. her? I actually, funny enough, I, when I was working at PJTV, she had interned for Laura Ingram for... Uh, Why uh, is that funny enough? Well, no, no. Fun, funny, I met her in Los Angeles. Oh, so funny, she's from cause... Michigan, where I was born. And then I went all the way to Los Angeles uh, to meet another it. Michigan okay. girl. Sorry, yeah, I didn't set it up. Yeah, way to, way to point out my crappy premise there, uh, Dennis. But uh, no, I'm but, but here's, here's the funny part about that. The guy at PJTV, because I almost didn't sign with him, he was an older sort of libertarian Jewish gentleman, met this young conservative Christian who was you know, somewhat edgy. And it, he, it was clear he was trying to woo me to go sign with the company. And he said, you know, I know someone who would be perfect for you. And he gave me this girl's phone number. And I was like, that's really, that's creepy. I'm not going to call her up, but, I, you know, Facebook stalk her. And so I checked her out on Facebook and I said, oh, maybe this could work. And uh, then uh, she had interned for Laura Ingram. So then we kind of both met because of the companies we'd worked for. And uh, yeah, that, then it, it came from. How circle. old were you? 22 or 23. Oh, so you met young. Yeah. That's really young. nice. And then how long did you date? We dated for two years, engaged for one. And I dated another girl for five years through high school who just tore my heart out of my rear that did a lot of damage, uh, namely because of the way we broke up and the guy she started dating after me. So uh, it was great when I met my, my wife, who was just fantastic. So she did you a service. She did. Yeah, she did. And a lot of times the stuff that's very painful turns out to be good stuff. Yeah. Not always, but but a lot of times. It some sometimes it is. You know, they say whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Not necessarily. Well, that that I don't. I know that was Nietzsche, and it's not true. I mean, it's it's it, you know, if you, somebody tortures you, you're not. You, it, 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 it's not a good thing. All right. It, <laughs> it, I mean, it's it, it's it, it's it, it's often true, but it isn't always true. It's not a rule exactly. of life. Exactly. So let me ask you the um, when you you're you're very well known, and especially with young people. 
So what is a typical sighting of you go like? Mm. Depends. I just recently, you know, we had a guy who uh, tried to smash a pint of beer on my face. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, For political but, reasons? Well, no. He, he had actually basically he would threatened uh he had offered five hundred dollars to uh for every member of ice the immigration uh, enforcement who was killed he'd offered five hundred dollars to kill every member of ice and uh then why, he, why isn't he arrested well he might be uh and then he was also uh uh posting about me how he wanted a piece of me for years and so i showed up dressed as a genie and said you know uh, you're down to two wishes and uh, what was it you were looking at and he tried to try to hit me with a a, a pint of beer and then ran away uh, so i did confront him because he was violent and plotting active mm -hmm. violence but most of the time it can go one of two ways yeah people are very grace uh, gracious right or um typically speaking the people i had a couple of close calls when i lived in new york city because people are so in such close proximity right uh that i guess they feel more comfortable with with just being hostile usually though the people who i can tell are hostile it's a look or they say something passive aggressive i will tell you this i had a i had was clearly spit in a cup on a plane ride in the oh, last week. No. I have a, by, I'll show a it to you afterward. Attendant? I don't know who spat in it, but I can show you a picture afterward. Clear as day, a loogie right in there. And uh, I just said, hey, there's a film on top of this. What's going on? It's and depressing. She, she immediately gave me a can of water. So I don't think it was her, but she saw it. She didn't con She didn't argue. She said, oh, uh, and gave me a, the can of water. Jesse Jackson used, it tells that he used to spit in white people's, well, he was a waiter, yeah. and he would spit in their uh, soup. That sounds racist. You didn't go to school then. You you would have learned that uh, a black cannot be racist. Well, yeah. No, no, I'm not. Did you know that? No, I'm I, serious. That that was taught to me when I was at college. Yeah. A black cannot be a racist. That is that was one of the eye-opening moments that I understood that I was in a place of nonsense called college. Yeah. Th there were there were many such moments. There were no differences between men and women. A uh, black cannot be a racist. The United States and the Soviet Union are moral equivalents. I mean, we're they were they're always wrong. It yeah. was it was it was an eerie realization for me. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that historically, you just give it enough time, the the left really is almost always wrong. That's right. And so the question is, are they wrong and therefore they're leftist? Or, or do they become leftist and therefore... And I, I don't mean this to be cute or even insulting, even though I acknowledge it's an insult, but I think that both are operative. I think you don't think clearly, and so leftism appeals to you, and then leftism reinforces a non-clarity of thought. To think that the United States and Israel are the great villains in the world yeah. means definitionally... There's something broken about your ability to morally think clearly. I think it's because the left hates uh, strength. I really do believe that. And here's I, w I was just thinking about this and talking about this with my, my producer, Johnny Boy. Um, that, you know, they, they, they preach sort of weak meekness they construe, they misconstrue with weakness. It's not the same thing. Biblically, we know that meekness is, sub is, is being submissive to God. It's not about right. being weak. Right. Um, but think about this, you know, again, back to tax policy, back to, to how they score soccer games. Um, weak people are the people who hurt you and betray you the most. Now, strong people can become bullies, but strong people can but also become... But they're not strong. Bullies are not strong Right, right. well, they're mob mentality, they're weak no, people. No, 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 exactly. But the, the point is, uh, only it strong takes people can be generous. to be good. Yes. And whereas it, it, That's the right. weak are incapable of generosity because they've never even had the opportunity. And they've been so busy thinking about themselves, and if you th talk about this financially, if you talk about this relationally, um, the weak are incapable of generosity or helping their fellow man. Only the strong can. Doesn't mean that all strong people are good people, but no. it's, it's, they are the Correct. only people who can do good, that... and I believe the left uh, despises positions of strength. There, are, there There's another thing uh, about, I, I keep thinking, why do they hate the U.S. and Israel more than any other country, including Iran? Which is a, which is truly the most despicable regime outside of North Korea on Earth. Yeah, and 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 they certainly don't hate China. Which which, tor you you talk, they talk about Putin killing journalists. That's that is rare in Russia compared to China. I know, and I know what happens in Russia. I'm not denying it, but it's far more common in China. And they're they're have a romantic a love affair with China. So why the U.S. and Israel? I have another theory. The United States and Israel are. Are, are, are like the last two Western countries to affirm national identity. Mm -hmm. And they hate that. 
I think you're probably right. There's a component of that, too. Mm -hmm. I was in Cancun when they did the Climate Summit. This was before it was the Paris Accord. It was the Kyoto Protocol. I was there when Ted Turner got up and proposed China's one-child policy. He right. did it on stage to thunderous he applause. He is so sick that he actually, and you know, he has like seven children. Did yep. you know that? He has a lot of kids. I yes, know and he said he, he regretted that he had that many children. I mean, imagine being that man's child. Thanks, I, Dad. I mean, I'm sure, I have to believe he said, guys, it's not you personally, it's the number. Yeah. But it's still, it's, this, that's what I mean. They love ideas more than people. Well, and the idea of zero population growth yeah. in and of itself is, I have contempt for humanity. I don't want to see more people. Yeah. Fix, fix climate change, kill all people. That's the only way you do it. And isn't it interesting, too, that that's, that's kind of a, not to get into the science of it, but in the Midwest, you know, Michigan, where I'm from, they've had record temperate years. The best growing seasons for cherries, which are a very persnickety crop, they need a long, slow-thawing winter and a mild summer. So it's like, remember it was... Wait a minute. How do you know about the climate needed for cherry growing? That, that's impressive. I have, I have family who work in cherries. Yeah, and you know what happens when they have a great cherry crop you season? You have family working in cherries? Yes. You're my man. Do you like cherries? I'll have them Folks, send you a bundle. Folks, I have never met anyone. I do love cherries, but I never met anyone whose family worked in cherries. Yeah, on my, on, on my wife's side. But do you know what happens when they have a great cherry crop? What? They have to dump They have to dump them. Why? To price fix. Because the ch prices of cherries would be too low. So last the last two years, they've been dumping record numbers of cherries because the crop yields have been so fantastic. So here's the thing with cherries. Again, it requires sort of a very By the way, mild it's a healthy plant. food. It's a very healthy food. Yes. It's healthier than the acai or the dragon fruit or the fruit of the day. Cherries are every bit as good. It's just they've been overlooked. High fiber, low glycemic, and delicious. Good for your brain? Okay. Very good for your brain. Oh, um, I'll keep eating them. But it, when you say record, <laughs> record, record heat... Right, then it changes to climate change because we had record cold. And they say, well, hold on, it's, it's any extreme temperatures. But hold on a second. The Great Lakes are at record highs because of good precipitation, and they have had record moderate climates. How do you explain that? Record okay. slow thawing winters and moderate summers. Right. It's, well, it, you know. Anyways, the, they dump cherries. Same thing with milk. They dump milk to price fix milk. Those of you watching should know about that the climate change example is a good one about loving ideas more than people. Read Bjorn Lomborg, L-O-M-B-O-R-G, does not, he totally is on board that the climate is getting warmer, okay? But he, but he knows that the solutions only hurt people, but they don't hurt rich people. Right. They hurt the poor people of Africa who are dying for fossil fuel electricity to bloody, uh, ha, ha, be able to to cook food in their house and not use a fire, which will uh, be terribly dangerous. And 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 you can't grow without electricity. You cannot have an economy. Yeah. We became rich thanks to fossil fuel, but now we tell Africans, don't you dare use fossil fuel. Yeah. Because you will be polluting the climate with the food of life, carbon dioxide. We also want to tell them they can't use DDT for mosquitoes. We That's go, right. We go, here's we a net. Millions died because of that. Right. Here's a net for when you sleep. Okay, what do I do for the other 18 hours out That's of the right. day, yes. Ashton Kutcher? Oh, did he tell them that? Yeah, he did a charity, Nothing But Net. And I was like, how about, how about net and also chemicals that get rid of malaria? How about an all-encompassing sort of solution? It was called right. Nothing But Net. All right. How are we doing on time? What's our... Uh, <laughs> I can tell I'm we bored should. I know, no, I, I, no, on the contrary, it went very fast. This is actually a big deal. Folks, I really, I really, I mean, I know that the vast majority of people know, but I, I, if I'm getting you even 10 more people to watch you, it's worth it. Well, thank so you louder much. with Crowder. Louder and, with Crowder. And you, you, you will truly enjoy it. You're a gutsy guy. You're a funny guy. We need you. America's better because of Steven Crowder. Well, I'm a, you know, they say this a lot in comedy. They're like, there are a lot of uh, sort of David Tell babies, or there are a lot of Norm Macdonald babies, meaning there, there are generations of comedians who've uh, really sort of been born out of a specific genre or style. And uh, I am definitely a, a, de a big part of what I do. I'm a Dennis Prager baby. When it comes to mm, a lot of conservative radio, I would always switch to yours because you, do you would deal with the, the macro issues, which is what's always interested me. I I'm not a political animal. A lot of people me ask about local me races. I'm going, right. I can't tell you who's running for right. the 18th the district. The big issues. The but, big issues. Uh, I, along with a lot of people who work for me, are, there are a lot of Dennis. Pra there are a lot of Prager babies out there. People who are very mm. influenced by you. Do we not get to talk about cigars at all? We can't even discuss it. Of course we can. Let's end. It. Let's end with cigars. All right. Do you, I, I told you this is the first show. I'm not smoking a cigar because 
It's been banned by Facebook. So uh, you have a journal. I do. Tell me about it. I do, and I specific, it's specifically from uh, a journal that was given to me by YouTube, so I use it to write nothing but conservative material and cigar journal. Um, so, you know, I thought that so was... So what does that mean, a cigar? You you write what you smoked and whether you enjoyed it? Yeah, I have an A see. to F rating. It goes backwards Is that because right? I start it at the end of the page. Uh, and, uh, yeah, up to about... You know what? I agree with you on that. I won't even say the name because I don't want to hurt a brand. Everybody talks about that, and I don't get it. I find it very overrated. Totally. I find it very cigarette-y. I, I don't get it. I don't enjoy it. Let's see what else here. Look at this. There's three more pages, yeah. So, so you... okay. But you'll see that the, do you the like brand strong? you really like. Do you like strong, or do you... Yep, you'll yeah. see that my fathers all have really good so ratings. So we're, we're on that. We're on top of that. What about Double Ligero by... Uh... You know, it's funny. I'm a, I'm a bigger fan of their standard Ligero. Really? Yeah. I don't find it as tasty as Double Ligero. But I also haven't had but the best... But that's why there are a lot of cigars, because if we all found the same ones... Anyway, this is beautiful. I can't believe it. You are somewhat of a uh, what is it? A type? A type A? Is it called? I guess type is it. What is it called? Does it mean a? learning impaired? Because no, I'm... no, no. The <laughs> ones who are are very um, meticulous. A type A. Yeah, it's a type A personality. That's what it's called. Do you know what it is? And yeah. I'll, and we can. Leave, I I was diagnosed with like severe ADHD as an adult, which I know you know it's a controversial topic. But the point is, regardless of of, of drugs or medication, let's get away from that or putting kids on Ritalin, which I'm against. Um, I realized that I was going to have to hyperly organize my life and take notes. Otherwise, I would just be like a... That's great. That Let off. me say this. The trick, I'll say it to all of you watching, one of the biggest tricks in life is to know your strengths and your weaknesses and to then work against your weakness. I am naturally lazy. Right. I would play all day. I would just fool around, do it. Do what I want, sleep late, go to bed at 3 a.m., get up at 10, 11, then, you know, read a little and do music and, you know, one of my 14 hobbies and go with my wife for a leisurely lunch and then stop for a coffee and somehow the day is gone. Uh, I knew this at a very early age. You sound like a European almost. And, and, yes, that's right. That's exactly right. That's their dream. That's the, and to get paid by the government. Exactly. To do it. Subsidized. That's exactly right. That's, people say I'm very productive, and they're right. I am very productive. The reason is I work against my nature. Uh, it, it, the battle in life is with your nature. Yeah. Not with sexist, misogynist, racist, homophobic America. Yeah. The battle is with you. And that's the biggest difference between the left and the, and the right. The right knows that their biggest battle is with themselves, the left think their biggest battle is with America. I think that's a great point, and I know we're strapped for time. I think that's the best point to end on. That's that's that's, uh, that's deep. See, that's why I'm a Prager baby. You're a good man. Hey, you gonna come back? Absolutely, anytime. Yeah. Annie's uh, d does a Prager U video. A few Prager U videos for oh, us. Oh, very yes. nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, are you saying I? I thought you, you, said, you. I thought you said he does. No, the you camera do. Guy. I know that makes sense. I was looking. I at thought him. you said and he. No, no, no I no, have no. done a couple. Yeah, there's one uh, coming. If, I was, uh, around if it was him, Day. I would have gone you. Okay, all right. Just he point. is. He. That's. That's okay. Uh, more or less. So maybe clear. work against the not so polite nature with the pointing. Let's try and that's, work on that. Build some you're right. I. I. I will. <laughs> Steven Crowder, I'm Dennis Prager. See you next week.